we're joined by Jakob von Uxkel. He is the founder of the Right Livelihood Award. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Thank you. It's great to have you with us. So how did this begin? It really is like your program about breaking silences. You know, I was always wondering, why do we live with problems we can solve? Why are there solutions, but they're not taken seriously? I was always interested in these, the question of, you know, solutions and how do you get taken seriously? Now, if you grew up in Sweden and you realize that uh, suddenly in October, when the Nobel Prizes are announced, then there are these people who get taken seriously, not just in their own area. Suddenly, if you win a Nobel Prize, you can pronounce on anything and you get taken seriously and you're listened to. And uh, these awards were created in a very different day age when the belief in progress and technology was still sort of unlimited. There was no problem with the so-called third world. There was no ecological problem. And um, so there was a gap. And strangely enough, only one gap was filled in these hundred years. A Nobel committee created one new award, not started by Alfred Nobel himself, namely the one for economics. And I said, well, that's a bit strange. You know, there are very important other gaps here. So I proposed to the Nobel Foundation an award for environmental work and for human development. And I offered to provide some money to start this from the sale of my business. Obviously, I'm not as wealthy as Alfred Nobel, so it wouldn't have funded the award in the long term. But it was uh, to try to get them to take this seriously. And I received uh, a polite reply back saying that they had decided not to introduce any more Nobel awards. And so I then felt, uh, you know, um, obliged to try it myself. So I went back to Sweden, where I hadn't lived since I was a child. And I, I sent out an announcement. I found through my network two very good uh, recipients. The first year, I was told that it was debated in the Swedish media whether this was a KGB plot or a CIA plot to discredit the Nobel Prizes. You know, this was still in the Cold War. But uh, one member of the Swedish parliament believed so much in this that in five years of work, she managed to convince enough colleagues from all the political parties to invite us to present these awards in the Swedish parliament, which has now happened, happening for over, over 20 years. So that's in, in brief is the story. It's grown, the award, into other areas because it's a very open and democratic award. You know, Nobel Prize is only certain, very small group of people can nominate for, for a Nobel Prize. And with our award, anybody can nominate anybody, except, of course, themselves or their own organization. So we get um, nominations from all over the world. We knew that the environment remains a you know, very important issue. But we also realized that even in the areas where there are Nobel Prizes, like economics, even like medicine, like physics, only a certain group of people get these. You know, nobody from another medical tradition but West, modern Western medicine would ever get a Nobel Prize for medicine. No physics prize, no Nobel physics prize has ever got, gone to a solar energy physicist. So we honored the most successful photovoltaic, social, solar photovoltaics researcher in the world, an, an Australian, Marty Green, a few years ago. And we've honored economists like um, Professor Herman Daly, who is now at the University of Maryland, the pioneer of ethical, ecological, steady-state economics, because although he would deserve it in any objective world, he, wouldn't, he is very unlikely ever to get a Nobel Prize in economics. We've had a few other pioneers, Manfred Max Neef from Chile, Leopold Kor from the uh, from Austria, highly recognized economists, but they were teaching the wrong kind of economics. And you gave an award to Wangari Mathai, uh, what, 20 years before she Indeed, won the Nobel? That was kind of interesting, that we gave the award to her in, in uh, 84, which was the first year we had an all-women panel of recipients. And then exactly 20 years later, she won the Nobel Peace Prize. The Kenyan environmentalist. Kenyan, yeah, the, the um, initiator of the, the Green Belt reforestation movement in, in Kenya. And you awarded Munir, the great Indonesian human rights activist, yeah. a Right Livelihood Award. Yeah who later died, was yes. poisoned when he was taking a plane yeah. out of Indonesia. Yes. We, I mean, that was uh, one of these great tragedies that we have had other cases where we have not been able to save uh, people, uh, but other cases where we have saved them. I mean, the, in, in, um, in Nigeria, the cancer of Eva was still executed, but his closest collaborator told us that he felt that if we hadn't given the award to, the, to their organization, they would have killed him too. In another case from Guatemala, a human rights activist whose sister had been murdered in a political assassination told us that um, she, the chief of police actually told her when she came back from the award presentation that now you are untouchable, as he put it. Now you're so well known internationally that they won't dare to kill you. Unfortunately, she is still in, in good health. And that was Helen Mack, that her sister Mack. Myrna Mack, who exactly. died September 11th, another September 11th, exactly. 1990, at the yeah. hands of Guatemalan yeah. security forces, an anthropologist. How did you come up with the title of the award, the Right Livelihood Award? Well, I was looking around and I felt that it should symbolize the whole 
the whole life in a way. You know, it's as you know, it's a Buddhist term. I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I like this idea of saying that you know, it isn't just what what you do. It's how you live your life. And interestingly enough, it also challenges people to to think. You know, I've been told sometimes, actually, in the U.S., that uh, the name is too judgmental. You were saying that there are wrong livelihoods, and so of course there are wrong livelihoods. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the mess you're in. And another aspect, of course, has been that because it's very difficult to translate right livelihood into many languages, the award has become known for, in the German-speaking world, for example, it's entirely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. And I think that, that helps the recipients. It's not an anti-Nobel Prize, you know, but it is certainly a uh, prize which uh, ties in with what Alfred Nobel wanted to do. You know, his award was very progressive in those days, to have an international award in a very nationalistic age. And he said, I wanted to honor those who have brought the greatest benefit upon humanity. And in a very different world today, I think that's what we are trying to do. And that's why it's sort of interesting that even the family of Alfred Nobel sympathize with us. The, the most senior member of Alfred Nobel's family in Sweden is actually on our advisory council because they are so outraged about the um, Nobel Foundation introducing the economics prize. Simply because he hadn't begun that in... And eight... because they think it it's, was totally inappropriate, yes. Why? Well, I think, uh, you know, if you have an economics prize, then why not have a prize for ecology, for architecture, etc.? And I think they're also quite unhappy with, uh, with the choices. But their main reason is, of course, that uh, they, they object to this prize being presented as a Nobel Prize when it has nothing to do with Alfred It Nobel. was established by the Bank of Sweden? Exactly, by the Swedish National Bank. So probably the Nobel Foundation felt that they couldn't, couldn't refuse it. But, um, yeah, and, and the, you know, the t official name is sort of slightly different. But if you then get the, the, the book, the publication, every Every year called Nobel Lectures, there are the, the economics lecture is also in there, so they are playing a sort of double game. Hmm. In fact, Paul Krugman, I believe, as we broadcast this show today, yeah. is giving his lecture today. Indeed, and you know, one of the best recipients they have chosen. I mean, there have been some pretty, pretty shocking ones, but as I said, why not choose uh, somebody like Herman Daly? whose name is now being quoted again and again, as the, the current economic order is uh, sort of being seen as increasingly bankrupt. You know, he told us many of these things 10, 20 years ago. He wrote a book with a theologian, James Cobb, called For the Common Good. But especially his book on steady-state economics is, is highly up-to-date. And you uh, were a stamp collector. Well, a stamp collector since I was nine, but I was a stamp dealer. So it was actually my business, which, uh, when I sold that, which enabled me then to provide the initial funding for the award. For the first five years, I funded it from the sale of my stamp business. How did you start as a stamp collector? Why? Uh, my father was um, a pacifist, and so when I was nine years old, he one day he offered me to exchange all my, my toy guns, my water pistols, for a stamp collection. And um, I decided to accept the offer. Well, Jakob von Uskel, I want to thank you very much for being with us, founder of the Right Livelihood Award.